Awesome. Um, the strategic perspective, building a strategy for happiness and making, there we go. Uh, what can we do, not as individuals? I mean, one of, the, one of the really good news about happiness at work is that there are so many things you can do on an individual basis to make yourself and the people around you happier at work. And those have been well established. And we know those things like praise and recognition, like random acts of workplace kindness, like a friendly, cheerful good morning. And all of those work to make yourself and the people around you happier. And all of those are awesome. And we've talked a lot about those in previous conferences. But this time, I want to talk about the overall strategic perspective. Because what you can do as an individual will affect you and the people you work with on your immediate team. But what if you want the whole company to be happy? What if you want to create a, a happy multinational organization with hundreds or even thousands of employees? How do you do that? And that requires not only individual action, but also top-level strategic focus on happiness at work. And having visited a lot of the world's happiest workplaces, I want to share 10 things that we've seen a lot of these workplaces do. I'm not saying that all of these workplaces do all 10. I'm not saying that your workplace should do all 10. But just know that if you want not just happy pockets inside your organization, if you want to create an entire organization that is happy, these are 10 strategic focuses that will help a lot. And there's a theme running through this that we basically need to include happiness in everything. In everything we do in the organization, we need to think, is this going to increase happiness? then we should do it. Is this going to decrease happiness? Then we should probably not do it. So very, very quickly, 10 strategic tips. And the number one thing is that top leadership must be on board with this. Top leadership must believe in it and they must walk the talk. It's not enough to pay lip service to happiness. They got to mean it and they got to embody it and model it themselves. And if they don't, it's just never going to work. And I think my favorite example of that is Herb Kelleher who was the, the first president of Southwest Airlines. Um, and he said it very, very clear, clearly. It has to be job one. It cannot slip to being job two, three, four, or five. Then you've lost it. No matter how busy you get, taking care of your employees, being interested in them, communicating with them, honoring them is still job one. And that's something that uh, Southwest Airlines has been very, very clear about for the entirety of the company's history. And that is why you get behavior like this. You can pretend to have your attention for just a few moments. My ex-husband, my new boyfriend, and their divorced attorney are going to show you the safety features of Boeing 737 series. It's been a long day for me. To properly fasten your seatbelt, slide the flat end of the buckle. To release, lift up on the buckle. Position your seatbelt tight and lower across your hips like my grandmother wears her support bra. If you can land, you want to take your toys and get on. There's eight ways to get there. Two forward exit doors, two wing window exits, two rear exit doors, signs overhead, disco lights on the floor, lead each exit. Everybody gets a door prize in the seat back pocket in front of you along with 30 dollars First chewing gum wrappers, banana peels, and all that gives you leave for us from time It's a safety information card. Take it out, check it out. You'll notice in the highly unlikely event that the captain lands near a hot tub, everybody gets their very own teeny weeny yellow southwest bikini. One side slips on, take it out on lift hold the so, place it over your head, wrap that strap around your waist, buckle it in front, pull the tight. One side side, pull down on the red tab, inflate to manually inflate, blow the tube at your shoulder. The five students are coming by, hoping that you'll tell them how good looking they are. They're going to make sure your seat backs and tights are in their full upright and absolutely most comfortable position possible. And your chair on items are crammed and shoved completely under the seat in front of you, leaving absolutely no room for your knees or feet. As you know, it's a no smoking, no whining, no complaining flight. It's a please and thank you, and you are such a good looking flight attendant flight. Smoking is never allowed on board of Southwest. If you're not smoking, the lavatory the fine for that's $2,000, and if you want to pay that for your airfare, you should have loaned somebody else. <laughs> I think that is just amazing. Yeah, give him a hand. Now, what's kind of interesting is that Southwest Airlines is the only major airline in the world that has made money every single year for 45 years. In an incredibly tough industry where other airlines are losing billions, they have been profitable every single year. And if you ask them, how is that possible? Their top leadership is very clear. They say it's because we put our employees first. And they have embodied that and modeled that in so many ways. When we make our employees happy, they do a really good job that makes the customers happy. The customer comes second. When the customers, is, customers are happy, they come back, we make more money, and the stockholders are happy and they come third. So this top level focus on happiness, this app
absolute belief that happiness has to come first and the willingness of top leadership to walk the talk and actually live it and not just talk about it is the number one thing that a company must do if you want a happy organization. Tip number two, uh, have a positive company vision. Uh, the, the vision for the company cannot just be about increasing revenues by 1.8% in the next fiscal quarter. That is boring as hell and won't inspire very many people. So you need a positive vision. And this is surprisingly hard. I went to do a speech at the London Business School and they proudly had their vision on, uh, on a plaque in the reception. And this is what's their vision. I know that I took this picture, which is really hard to read. So here it is in text. Our vision is to be the preeminent global business school. What is wrong with this vision? It's not a vision, this is a goal. It might be a very valuable goal, but it's not a vision because it's about them. It's not about making the world better or happier in any measurable way. They've actually updated it since then. Uh, and now their vision is we strive to have a profound impact on the, the way the world does business and the way business impacts the world. Now it's a vision because now it's not about them. It's about something bigger than them. And that's what a company needs. It needs a mission, a purpose, a vision that is bigger than the company itself that inspires the people in the company. My favorite example of this is, is Patagonia. Uh, they make swimwear, ski wear, outdoor gear, uh, amazing, uh, amazing sportswear. And their vision uh, hangs in there. Their mission hangs proudly in their head headquarters in California. Uh, build the best product, cause no unnecessary harm, and use business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. They want to use business to create a better environment because they believe that our environment is being threatened uh, by over global overconsumption. And they do that in so many ways. As an employee of Patagonia, you can take leave of absence to go work for an environmental charity. They donate 1% of, uh, of turnover every year to environmental charities. And uh, a couple of years ago for Black Friday, which is the biggest shopping day in the US, they actually put out this ad saying, don't buy this jacket. Do not buy this jacket. And there was a long text saying, you know, our environment is being threatened by overconsumption. Uh, don't buy this jacket. Uh, let's say you have an old jacket, use that. Can you buy a used jacket? Do that. Do you have a jacket that is broken that you can have repaired? Do that. And only if you can't do any of those things should you buy this jacket. And I think that's a great way to serve your mission. And, and here's the cool thing. A good company vision is ultimately about happiness. It should be clear, when you look at this vision, it should be immediately, instantly clear why this vision makes the world a better and happier place. For instance, protecting the environment makes us happier. Uh, and I think that's a wonderful example. So that's tip number two, um, have a positive company vision. Tip number three for the company, focus on happiness, not satisfaction. And that's actually the biggest mistake that I see a lot of companies make now is that they, you know, they want to attract the best employees, they want the employees to stay there and work long, uh, for a long time. But what they do is that they do a lot of these things. So they say, you want to make our employees happy? Let's give them free fruit or smoothies or a fancy office space. And none of that is ever going to work. You can have a, you can have a company where you give employees every single thing on that list and it's still not a happy company. Because those things don't make us happy, they make us satisfied. And a lot of companies measure job satisfaction and focus on job satisfaction, and that's a mistake. We need to focus on happiness at work. Those two things are obviously related, but they're not the same thing. Here's the difference. Job satisfaction is what you think about your job. When you sit down and you rationally weigh all the pros and cons of your job situation, are you satisfied or not? But happiness at work is what you feel about your job. How does working there make you feel? Not being happy every single second of every single day, but overall, are you happy when you are at work? Most days, you look forward to coming to work. Most days, you go home thinking today was, an, today was a good day and you're excited to come back the next day. And that is a radical difference because then it's not about fruit and smoothies and a gym in the office. Then it's about two things in our model. The two things that actually make us happy at work are results and relationships. And that's what we need to focus on instead giving people the chance to get great results, do meaningful work, and knowing that that work is important and makes a difference, and relationships, knowing that you belong. You're valued as a human being, not just as a coworker, but as a person. We like you, you're gl we're glad you're on our team. We respect you and we treat you 
nicely. And those are the things that actually make us happy at work, cause positive emotions in our model, and that's why we need to focus. And all of that extra stuff, it's fine, I have nothing against it, but it's not what makes us happy. Uh, especially uh, the big thing in Danish workplaces right now is free fruit. A lot of Danish workplaces say, we need our employees to be happy, let's give them free fruit. And I have nothing against fruit, fruit is fine. But my question is, how many Danes are going to go home from work today and say, oh my God, I had the greatest day at work, I got an apple. <laughs> Nobody does that. Um, tip number four, appoint a chief happiness officer and a happiness team. Somebody who's in charge of this process, somebody who has time and energy to focus on this, I think that's incredibly valuable. And I see that in so many workplaces. I just spoke at a, for a, at a team for SAP who just hired a chief happiness officer uh, for that team of, of salespeople um, to focus on this. And I want to make it clear that when you find a chief happiness officer, it is not their job to make everybody else happy. That would be impossible, right? Uh, can you imagine that person going around with a clown nose going, are you happy today? <laughs> How can I make you happy? That would, that would not work. Uh, a chief happiness officer's job is more like a project manager, somebody in charge of the happiness project. Um, so come up with ideas, make a plan, follow up, and celebrate the wins uh, that, you, that you achieve in this project. I think, that is, um, I think that is the job of chief happiness officer. And having somebody in that role can be incredibly powerful. And also having a team of employees who are passionate about this project. We're actually going to hear that in the very next presentation. Uh, or sorry, in this session, we're going to hear from a, a happiness team from an organization. Uh, tip number five, have a plan, but include surprises. Uh, yeah, I think it's important that this process, this entire happiness process is planned. And I think a good plan goes maybe six or 12 months into the future. Uh, so you're not just coming up with things on a, an, a random ad hoc basis, but you actually have a plan that has, you know, a lot, a few, maybe a few big initiatives, but especially many small initiatives, I think that works really well. Uh, so you're not just doing, you know, we want to make our company happy, we'll have a big summer party. It's nice, but what about the rest of the year? I think you need many small, simple initiatives as well. Um, and then you need uh, a plan that has something for everyone, something that addresses both results and relationships, I think is really, really important. Um, and then, so you have the plan, but you also need surprises. Because when, when we, know, we know from, from research that when nice things happen to us that we expect, you know, everybody knows the summer party is coming, it's a great party, makes us happy, it's nice. Uh, but when nice things happen to us that surprise us, it makes us even happier. And I want to show you an example. This is from Innocent, uh, Innocent Drinks in, in the UK. They make these amazing smoothies. Um, and here's an example from our conference last year uh, of, of a random surprise thing they did. We have two lifts at Innocent. If you ask me, they are the most boring part of a building. No one ever does anything a lift. So I went to a big supermarket and I spent 60 pounds on all that terrible stuff that teenagers buy each other at Valentine's Day, and I turned the lift into the lift of love, okay? <laughs> so I bought a helium balloon, I put bunting up, um, I, uh, I bought a CD player and Barry White. <laughs> I put it in the corner, it made for some very awkward lift journeys. <laughs> it was very good. I bought love heart post-its and stuck them up, and I'd written who I fancied in the office. By the end of the day, it was full. Everyone found the moment to tell the person they fancied them. Um, but this costs me 60 pounds. Now, a lot of companies have a big budget, and I've got a great budget to make these things work. But what I asked for was that 60 pounds not to buy four more bottles of wine at the Christmas party, which would, it would be in my budget, but to make people come to work. This guy, Dan, had a terrible day at work, but the thing he wanted to go home and tell his girlfriend was, look at what Innocent did today. I want to make people smile every day. And I think that shows the value of those small things you can do, those surprising things that, that just come out of the blue. Uh, tip number six, I think, is also incredibly important. That's to hire for happiness. Um, if, if you want a happy workplace, you should not hire miserable bastards, okay? <laughs> because they will just come in and make everybody else equally unhappy. There's a company in Seattle. Uh, does anybody here play computer games? Yeah, me too. If you play computer games, you know Valve. They make uh, famous games like Counter-Strike and Portal and many others. They also have an online store called the Steam Store where you can buy computer games online. And they're very clear on this. They say hiring well is the most important thing in the universe. And I could, I could not agree more. It is the most important thing. And a lot of companies overlook this. A lot of companies hire for skills. And I 
think you need to take skills into account, but I also think you need to hire for happiness. A great example is Pret, a chain of cafes in the UK and now also around the world. And they say, you cannot hire someone who can make a sandwich and teach them how to be happy. So we hire happy people and teach them how to make a sandwich. And I think that's a beautiful, beautiful way to do it. Southwest Airlines do the same thing. And here's, here's some examples. You know, we've always thought that a sense of humor was a very important thing for our employees to have. And we've always been told and always asked our employees to take the business very seriously, but not take themselves too seriously. So we like to really check applicants for employment to see if they have a sense of humor. <laughs> And actually, you might think that's really difficult, but it's really not. It's very easy to see whether someone can enjoy um, a good, healthy sense of humor. And you might do it by showing up as the uh, interviewer, the recruiter, going out with your clothes on backwards. See if anybody laughs. See if anyone just stares at you like, you know, it's just an everyday occurrence. Um, we, one of our pilots, we have a lot of our line employees that actually are part of the interview process. And one of our pilots used to pretend that he was an applicant. So he'd sit in the reception room with all the nervous applicants and wring his hands and say, oh my gosh, what do you think they're going to ask us? And go on and on and on. And then the applicant would walk in for the one-on-one -on -one interview and there Frank would be on the other side of the desk. Well, you know, if people can't laugh about that sort of thing, they're just a little too um, taken with themselves for us to consider them a perfect match for our culture. I think that's just one example. Uh, but this idea that we're very careful with who we hire, and that we hire not just for skills, but also for happiness, somebody who will, be, will come in and be happy in that job, I think that is incredibly important. And also that we not hire the, ra the wrong people. I think a, a fantastic quote is by Dan Jacobs, who's the head of talent at Apple, who said, I'd rather have a hole in my team than an asshole in my team. Um, and I think that's incredibly important. Figure out, is, is this person somebody who's naturally happy, cheerful, friendly? Is it somebody who will be happy in this job, in this team, um, before you hire them? Um, and also happy onboarding. The first few days, the first few weeks in a new job are incredibly stressful. And I think it's important that people very, very quickly become happy in their new jobs, that we treat them as well as we possibly can, so they very quickly achieve results and relationships. My favorite example of this is from Zappos, um, an online retailer uh, based in Vegas, 2,000 employees. Um, and and they are, they're a very, very happy workplace. I've visited them several times. Um, one of my favorite things is that in the HR department, they have a ball pit that you can uh, book for meetings. Uh, here we are in their ball pit. Uh, with some friends. That's actually Maria right there, yeah. <laughs> and Joel is also in that picture. Um, and once you get it, it's actually very hard to get a job at, at Zappos. They really want to make sure you fit in and will be happy at work. And also then, uh, once you start working there, the first four weeks is training. Four weeks of, of, of onboarding, and that four weeks is 50% skills, like what you need, you know, computer systems and technology and everything else, and 50% culture. And I think that's an absolutely brilliant, brilliant thing to do. By the way, uh, Zappos do this radical thing, and as far as I know, they're the only company in the world that does it, where as part of the onboarding process in the first week, they will tell you, listen, we know working at Zappos is not for everybody. So if you quit right now, we will give you $3,000, which is probably a month and a half's wages for a lot of their uh, entry-level employees. So yeah, we'll pay you to quit. They, they want you to be sure that you want to work there. Um, so, uh, so yeah. Um, by the way, if, if, if you turn down the offer saying, no, I want to work at Zappos, they'll come back three months later, and now the offer is $4,000 to quit. Yeah, they want you to be absolutely sure that you will fit in there. I think that is a brilliant concept. And they're, as far as I know, the only organization in the world that does it. Tip number eight, promote and train managers for happiness. A lot of what we are talking about here may seem obvious to us, but to many managers, many leaders, it's not. Maybe you, they've taken an MBA or, or a business degree, and I can tell you in most business schools, you will learn nothing about happiness. So maybe we need to train them. And also, maybe we need to be very careful about who we promote to leadership positions. So it's not just the most driven and ambitious people, but it's actually the people who are very happy and can make their employees happy and help them get results and relationships. Uh, my favorite example of that is a company in, uh, in uh, uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil called Semco. 
And one of the things they do, they actually, uh, they actually every uh, six months, all of the employees rate their immediate manager. Uh, every manager gets a score, a combined score from zero to 100, and then all of those scores are published inside the organization. So every employee can see exactly how good every manager is. And then here's the kicker. As an employee of, Zappos, uh, of, uh, of uh, Simcoe, you're free to choose any manager you want. So if you're working for that guy and just got a 39, you can say, Arrivederci, I'm going to go over here, work for her, she got a 94. Um, so suddenly they have no bad managers. It's described in this book called The Seven Day Weekend. I highly recommend it. Two more. Uh, you got to look at your incentives. If, you, if you're saying that happiness at work is really important, but what you're rewarding is only sales numbers and profits and the bottom line, then you're doing it wrong. Um, so you, you can't say you value one thing, but then reward something else, okay? Um, I think a fantastic example of that is a Danish bank, and yes, there is a Danish bank called Middlefart. <laughs> They're fantastic. They, they spoke last year. They're amazing. Um, and uh, I, I, we visited them uh, last year to study them and figure out why they're so happy. They actually were voted happiest workplace in Denmark. And they're a bank. Um, and we asked them, so we have, you know, what do you do, what do you do? And then we asked them, what's something you don't do that all the other banks do? And they said, we have no individual KPIs, no individual goals, no individual bonuses for each employee. We only have team-based goals and team-based bonuses. And that way, it's, it's the cooperation uh, people are working together to achieve a goal, and that makes them much, much happier. And you don't have that situation where you say you, you value happiness, but you reward something else. And finally, tip number 10, share the good stories. And this is something every organization really, really ought to do. And thank you, Michael, for bringing me my prop. Um, the best example I've seen of this is a company in Chile called uh, Transbank. They handle all credit card payments in, in, the, in the entire country. And they have a book uh, called El Valor de lo que tenemos, The Value of What We Have, which is basically a celebration of all the good things in the organization. So, and, and that's the thing. In many organizations, there are so many good things going on all the time, but we never talk about them. We talk mostly about the frustrations and the problems and the goals we haven't achieved. But in this book, they celebrate all the cool stuff that is going on, both business results, but also being named best workplace in Chile, also, you know, the, the, the day uh, the, where they could take their children to work, there are some amazingly cute kids, apparently, uh, in this company, or all the charity work that they do. So they have this entire celebration of all the good things in the organization. They printed this book, they give it out to everybody, uh, customers and employees. And I think that is a beautiful way to share all the good things we have in the organization. Because if we don't focus on them, if we don't talk about the good things, it's hard to be grateful for the good things. So those were 10 very, very quick tips, and I hope this has inspired you for how you can take a more strategic view on happiness working in your organization. And it all comes back to basically what is, our, what is our motto and what we keep returning to is that happiness at work is something we do. And if we want to create happier workplaces, we can't just dream about it, we can't just wish for it, we got to actually go out and do it. And these are 10 ways an organization can do it. Thank you. All right. All right. I'll not ask you question about, uh, questions about the 10 points here because um, um, as I told this morning, you, um, you can get all the slides, you can get all the presentations on video on the website and you'll get a newsletter so that you can uh, recap whatever you want to recap. But let's, let me just put one question. Yeah. Let's talk about the state of the union. <laughs> How, not our church, but our cult is actually doing. Yes. Because when we talk about the state of workplaces, how many of you experience that there's a lot of pressure out there? How many experience that? How many experience that we have increasing levels of stress? Quite a few. The majority, the vast majority. That's kind of the experience. So we talk about how important workplace happiness is and how big the impact is. But still there's an experience that things are moving in the wrong direction. 
What is your reflection about that? <laughs> um, has anybody here heard about the tiger oil memos? No? Uh, you can Google it. It's amazing. It's so cool. Um, apparently in, in Houston, in Texas, in the 1970s, there was an oil company called Tiger Oil. And, and they had a CEO, I forget his name, but he wrote the most amazing memos to his organization. Things like, um, there will be no more birthday celebrations in the office. You can celebrate in your free time. He wrote a memo saying, I can swear and curse because I'm the CEO. You can't. If you swear, you're fired. And a whole list of memos like that saying, you know, I'm the boss. I can do whatever you want. Just do as I say. And in the 1970s, that would be perfectly okay. That would be perfectly accepted. People would be like, that's a strong leader taking charge of his organization. Could you get away with that kind of crap today? Hell no. Uh, people who worked in an organization like that would be running away screaming and they would be left only with the people who can't find jobs anywhere else. And they haven't met, they haven't met the, millenn the millenniums. Exactly, and the millennials. And also, that company, by the way, is now out of business. They don't exist anymore. Hardly surprising. Uh, the Me Too movement. The Me Too movement, I think, is amazing because it's taken something that, again, has anybody seen Mad Men? The way they treat women in Mad Men, uh, you know, in workplaces in the 50s? That, were, that was perfectly okay. That's the way things were back then, and that kind of behavior is just not okay anymore. So there, I, I have no doubt, and you can ask yourself, what would, would you rather work in a typical workplace in your industry today or 50 years ago? Yeah. I think it's, it's pretty clear that that workplaces are better today. We tend to forget that. Time's we, up, Alexander. <laughs> so let, let me just summarize. Sometimes it's a very good idea to take a high lift in the helicopter, and then you'll see the change, yeah. the positive change. Exactly. Ladies and gentlemen, Alexander Kirov. <laughs>